Okay, so their cameo is a bit out of my price range. <gasps> But I got Mona to say my name on TikTok live. Yeah, Athena. That's me. Yo, thank you for the show. I'm you. I'm you. This part's always quite the tone shift for those of you who don't know me yet. But lovers, welcome back to the lore series where we explore shows no one else is brave enough to. Now these shows might be for kids, but my videos where I look far too deep into them and joke about them are not. I say bad words, some people say I shouldn't, but it's it's just who I am. I have a massive respect for children's entertainers, but I entertain young adults and adults who grew up with this nostalgic media and just want to talk about it and have a goof, okay? I say this disclaimer every time and without fail there is still somebody that's upset. I don't know how much more upfront I can be. The subject of today's video is the Canadian show Nanaland that ran from 1999 to 2004, with one season of shorts and two seasons of full-length episodes. Created by Jamie Shannon and Jason Hopley, who also created Mr. Meaty, which couldn't be any more different. If Nanaland's tagline is heal your inner child, Mr. Meaty's would be kill the hopes and dreams of your inner child. I'm sorry to get so harsh, but like I loved Nanaland and I- <laughs> Mr. Meaty is something different. I can't help but compare the show to Ubi, which I also covered in this series. Both season ones are comprised of shorts, where characters went through design changes, like Nano really glowed up in season two. Both don't follow a nuclear family, but instead a grandparent and grandchild dynamic. Both require puppetry, different types, but still. And both aired on Nickelodeon, where the showrunners had two shows on the network. And both have a type of baby talk. The only difference there is in Nanoland, the adults talk in complete sentences. <laughs> In the shorts, there's only three characters you need to know. Mona, the sweet little green alien toddler, Russell the dog, who she calls Russer, and Nana. Nana, as I said, looks very different. She looks more like Beaker's grandma than Mona's. All the shorts are three minutes long and are being uploaded to the official Nanaland YouTube channel. One thing that really makes me laugh is the thumbnails pretty much describe exactly what happens in the shorts. That bird is picky. Bug on my cookie. Buried treasure? Okay, at least that last one was a question. <laughs> we don't know if they're actually is buried treasure. We have to watch to find out. The first one that really stood out was Birdie. In this short, we see a lot of the animals of this world. This ladybug with olives for eyes that really creeps me out. And this bird whose bedazzled eyes make it look like she has tinier eyes like a fly. They also updated the animal designs in the full length episode seasons, so that's good to know. The shorts end with us seeing their world with Nana's house being the biggest thing on it. First thing I thought of was don't hug me, I'm scared, but then I thought about the context of the series. And I think this is how Mona sees the world. It's beautiful, but the most beautiful place of all is her Nana's house. Oh. Freaking adorable. In the short episode Scarf, they could not have made it look like Russell was more dead. <laughs> after he was accidentally flung from tug of war. Before Nana even knew if he was okay, she turned to Mona and was like, did you see that? Wow, did you see that? Yeah, dude, how could she not? Make sure the dog is alive. This show is very memeable because of how earnest the characters are, the unique visual choices, and the improvisational feel. How much of Nanoland is improvised? All of it. Oh. Well then, how improvisational it is. In the short Don't Cry, we see how emotionally intelligent Russell is. When he sees Mona is about to cry, he does everything he can to cheer her up. From barking to blowing raspberries like this, which I've never seen a dog do. Yeah. I'm kind of one of those annoying fucks that can't suspend their disbelief. In the end, what gets Mona to cheer up is him licking her feet, which is something dogs do. But the way he lifted up her foot with his hands and proceeded to put the entirety of her foot in his mouth? Whatever could this remind me of? And they love to theft people's feet. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know what's the worst part is like clearly they're going, they're, they're leading into the fact that he's a dog and then he's just like using his hands and he's like, and guess what? I got these opposable thumbs to grab your little toesies. And we'll talk more about Russell later, but Mona's reactions are the most relatable thing I've ever seen. Monk. That's a lolly. I get overexcited about shit too, and TikTok has convinced me that this is a bad thing. God forbid you squeal over a cheese grater. If my videos have one takeaway, don't let people extinguish your joy with what they think is cringe. Who gives a shit? I'd rather be cringe and happy than boring and fucking miserable. Mona loving her life and loving nature is something we should all strive for. That doesn't have to expire once we pass the age of five. That being said, the shoelace snake short was confusing. Mona and Russell just 
just kept provoking the snake until he slithered away. So I guess he's just peaceful and doesn't want trouble. What the hell is that? Why is he huge and dancing on the on the world? What? Is this foreshadowing the snake hand invasion of 04? We see giant versions of the subject of shorts in the episode Spider, feeding the birds, blowing a balloon, frog, and many others, and I started getting used to it after a while. It's just the world growing and vibing with Mona. Speaking of the world growing. The pilot episode titled Nana's House I believe was never aired and was only released on DVD. The new intro slash theme song shows Mona's mom for the first time. And she looks exactly like her daughter. Longer dark hair but same big black eyes and green complexion. So this show is mainly when Mona visits her Nana. Nana land. Nana land. Oh shit! I thought she just lived there like Ube. And the shot of Mona running into the backyard with all the wonder in the world is such a testament to how much she loves visiting her Nana. Oh my god, this is so cute! And the musical underscoring is perfect. It makes every experience she's going through feel like the most important thing in the world, even if it's super mundane. Picture it, there's an orchestra swelling as we, for the first time, touch Grass. I know it's hard to picture, but just bear with me. You're telling me you wouldn't tear up if a three-year-old fed a chipmunk in front of you with all the joy in her heart? Because that's what happened. Mona then looks through the fence and sees Nana's neighbor. This is Mr. Wilson. I don't know what's wrong with me. I always mishear names. She said Wilkins. It's Mr. Wilkins. Wilkins, okay? So this is Mr. Wilkins in the pilot. He looks quite different in this pilot. They had to age him up, what with him being in love with Nana, but we'll get to that later. Mr. Wilson Wilkins. puts on a very impressive puppet show for them. Dude has skill. How is he voicing all those characters? Sometimes they speak at the same time. Ah! Get this dude on Canada's Got Talent. Then Mona and Russell enjoy a bit of eating ASMR. Again, this was made from 1999 to 2004. This is literally just ASMR before ASMR existed. You know what takes me out of the relaxing vibes a bit? Russell being built like that? Why are his hind legs like kangaroos? Yeah, Nana, kick him out of the house! <laughs> Let's get these cozy vibes back as Nana reads a story to us. I love that we see what the characters see. I love that they have a bit of commentary as they read. See a little juice spill there? See, he spilled some juice. Because that's how you read to a kid. You don't just read the words. You're like, oh, look at the picture. Is he smiling? There's something so genuine about it. This is so comforting. Okay, but my mood did change again as Mona picked up a feather from the backyard and started rubbing it on her face. Clean that kid at once. I'm worried about diseases. I'm sorry. I know kids explore the world through touch and putting things on their face, but with some things, you really shouldn't let them. There's a great joke in the musical Trail to Oregon about that that I'm not sure I I could show. At the end of the episode, Nana and Mr. Wilson, Wilson sang, Mona's mom picked her up, and Nana said, see you tomorrow. And then we cut to Mona at home sleeping. The world we see at the end might be Mona's dreams. Like, she just can't wait to get back to Nana's house. Which is sweet, but I feel a little bad for the mom. If I had a show, it would be called Nana Land because I love Nana's house. Oh, that's nice, sweetie. I love Nana's house, too. In the poster for the show about my life, it would be me and Russer and Nana and the next door neighbor, Mr. Wilson. What? Huh? That's it? Shouldn't there be somebody else in the poster? It's me, Russer, Nana, Mr. Wilson. No. We are lost. <gasps> According to the Lost Media Wiki, there's two lost shorts and six lost episodes from season three. And two episodes that are described as partially found because clips from that episode are posted on the official Nanaland YouTube channel. When I go to the channel's full episode playlists, I see nine unavailable videos. These unavailable hidden videos could be privated or scheduled to post. So the creators most likely have access to all of the episodes and are just slowly re-releasing them. I'm almost positive of this because I've seen every full episode they've posted, but this account also posts shorts, and some of the shorts I've seen, I do a double take because I haven't seen the episode where this is from. Oh, and would you look at that, they actually do have an upload schedule that I obviously wasn't aware of because if I was, I would have scheduled this video to be posted after all the full episodes were released. But I didn't know that until it was too late. Just more things to add to my inevitable things Athena P missed in lore videos video. Oh, that's gonna be a long one. The resurgence of appreciation for the series started on Tumblr in 2015, with a clip from the short 
Peapod. This gained a lot of traction with over 100,000 notes according to Know Your Meme. Because the goofy baby talk way Mona said all these vegetables was very amusing. Smado and Snutter Motto means tomato and another tomato. If they didn't show you exactly what she was looking at from her perspective, it would be almost impossible to translate what the hell she's saying. The longer episodes were even easier to grasp because Nana was there to translate the baby talk for us. The more recent way Nana Land went viral is through the song, Who's that wonderful girl? Could she be any cuter? Which absolutely blew up on TikTok. Bruh. People were using the sound, the cap cut green screen of the characters singing the song, with different captions, some people were sharing their pets. The possibilities are endless. It's no wonder this sound had the reach it did. The visuals are so distinct, and if those characters don't stick in your head, the song certainly will. Mr. Wilson Wilkins. had that age up I was talking about. Mustache acquired! And his name is actually Mr. Wooka now. He also doesn't have to give these puppet shows on a ladder over the fence anymore. Now there is a door in the fence that leads straight to Mr. Wooka's backyard. And in this first episode titled Lollipop, we find out that Nana is actually Mona's mom's mom. Throughout the series, Nana mentions about Mona's mom when she was younger. Remember how I mentioned ASMR in the pilot? Well, I just had to mention again how sensory this show is. There are so many textures, like this shot of water soaking into the soil, or Mona's hands playing with clay. And I got so fixated on this. I stumbled across this article about the importance of introducing children to textures. It actually really helps with their development. I point this out because I feel like I've seen a lot of parents dismiss shows where the lesson isn't super obvious, like those shows that spell out ABCs, reading, numbers, math, and those lessons are important too. But emotional lessons and creating a world that makes kids excited to explore their own is nothing to scoff at. Now everything up until this point was very tame. Now it's time for me to to overthink this preschool show that's primarily improvised. Are you ready for the most ridiculous takes you've ever heard in your life? Can you see me? The first time I noticed the inclusion of us, the audience, in this world was in the episode Free when Mona caught us in her net. Who are we? Why are we in Nana's backyard with them? In the episode Playday, Mona turned around and talked directly to us once again. She's the only one who acknowledges us, it's not consistent, and she only ever talks to us when no one else is around. And that's when I realized, we are her imaginary friend. No other explanation makes sense. And the episode I had this realization was in the episode about pretending. Coincidence? Probably. Another time Mona talked to us was in the episode Love. She once again talked to us when no one was around, and this time she talked to us about the fact that she walked in on two chipmunks kissing, which is pretty wild. Her mind was blown and so was ours. <laughs> about me time. When I was younger, I remember going to the zoo and seeing two tortoises wrestling. And I remember my aunt was trying to pull me away, but I was very intrigued by this. I even drew a picture of them wrestling. And this is the picture I drew. I think I know now why my aunt was trying to pull me away. I don't think they were wrestling. And then I turned to the camera, my imaginary friend, and I said, they're wrestling! One last thing before I move on to the next episode where Mona was talking to us. Official Nanaland YouTube besties, please turn on off automated chapters because YouTube named a section of this episode hookah. I guess that's what they heard when Mona said wooka, but uh, yeah, there's no hookah in Nanoland. That would be wild. In the episode Birdsong, this was the first time Mona talked to us while there were others around. Mona talks to us to clarify that she's talking to Russell. You didn't know I talked to Russell. And Russell is very confused by this. Huh? There's more evidence of us being imaginary friends, but I'll get to that later. Keep it in your back pocket. Get some ass, you old fox. Mr. Wooka is head over heels for Nana, as he should be, innocently flirting with her every chance he gets. Would you like to uh, share a lollipop here, Nana? <laughs> 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 oh, yes, that was from the very first episode, and he says something sweet every single episode, but I'm compiling their best moments. Someone has to. Season 2, episode 5, Free, he tells Nana, well, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I modeled the princess, princess after you. Mr. Wooka, more like Mr. Smooth. Uh, 
damn. The first time we see Nana's possible reciprocation is in the season two episode Chirp, where she notices Mr. Wooka and then begins fixing her hair. This is my golden bachelor, all right? You need to understand how invested I am in them. In the episode Goodbye, Mr. Wooka said to Nana over the phone, how you doing, sweetie? They are dating. But he also called to check on Mona, who was upset over losing her balloon. Here's what Nana thinks about that. What a glorious gentleman. I love them! In the season three episode Hootenanny, Nana and Mr. Wooka are making music together. Mr. Wooka plays a banjo and harmonica, and Nana plays her ukulele and fiddle. And in their own songs, we've also seen Nana play piano, and Mr. Wooka play piano and an accordion. A very musical couple of besties. Can they kiss in 2024? Can they please kiss? In this episode, they also serve dinner together and just serve in general better work, bitch. They also keep talking about how Nana's lasagna and Mr. Wooka's salad make a complete meal. Is this some kind of metaphor for them being together? And the whole message of this episode is making things whole. W-H-O-L-E whole, you sick freaks. Anyway, this is my fan art of Mr. Wooka and Nana if they fused like a fusion in Steven Universe. This is the ideal puppet form. We kept Mr. Wooka's mustache and Nanny's thick dump truck for maximum beauty. Could they be any cuter? I think the episode Nana Olympics might have had my favorite Wookana moments. After Mr. Wooka's puppet show, he joins them in Nana's backyard to do exercising and games. He loves her so much this old ass man is participating in a potato sack race. And can I say, he's a much bigger part of season three than he is in season two. In season two, all of his moments were kind of confined to the puppet show, but it's clear that he's in their life a lot more now. By the end of the episode when Russell and Mona were dancing together, Nan exclaimed, huh, I wish I had a dancing partner. And Mr. Wooka comes through in a full suit to dance with Nana. They both dipped each other. They're so in love. Mr. Wooka and Nana even continued dancing when Mona's mom came to pick her up. This is a date, your honor, they're dating. In the episode Purple Monster, when Mona encountered a praying mantis, I thought that Nana would be able to calm her down, but she too was like, oh, a bug? Huh, let's go and see. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that thing? And then they ran to Mr. Wooka. Let it be known that when Nana is frightened, she went to Mr. Wooka for help. In the episode Helpful Girl, he's pushing Nana on a swing set, and they are once again confirmed to be hanging out after Mona leaves. Keep that swing up, Nana says. Where is their art? Where is their fan fiction? Where is their double date with Grandpu and Inca? Mr. Wooka, aside from being the sweetest with Nana, is also amazing with Mona. In the episode 123 Apple Tree, we see that Mr. Wooka is very much a grand paternal figure to Mona, even when Nana has to do her own thing. Mona and Russell join Mr. Wooka in his backyard, where he shows them all the crafts he makes with sticks and twigs and pine cones and... You guys knew this was coming. I wish this puppet was my grandpa. You've heard about my daddy issues. Now get ready for my granddaddy issues. That's right. From the very first episode, we have seen that this puppet gives the best puppet shows. Look at these two beefcakes learning about the magic of friendship. Yeah, but we, we play together because it's more fun. The variety of these puppets are also super engaging. Like, these ones reminded me of the Canadians from South Park. We also have sock puppets. In the episode Night Night Nana, he puts on a shadow puppet show. But by far the weirdest puppet show moment was in the episode Bubbles. Usually Mr. Wooka isn't seen with his puppets in his pre-intro to the show, but this time a puppet named Gary goes up to him to ask if he's in this show. So did Mr. Wooka cast these shows with other alive puppet creatures? Calling it a puppet show is kind of redundant if this is just live theater with puppet actors. To be fair, even though Mr. Wooka called this puppet by his name, showing some form of familiarity, he too seemed shocked by this, turning to us and exclaiming, whoa. Oh, but it gets so much weirder because in this show, Gary the puppet puts on his own puppet show. So this is a puppet show within a puppet show within a puppet show, but then Gary's puppet puts on its own puppet show. So there's a puppet show within a puppet show within a puppet show within a puppet show. And this happens three more times. So this is actually a puppet show within a puppet show within a puppet show. 
When we use the word meta nowadays, aside from Facebook's parent company, it means being self-referential. Meta is also a prefix used at the beginning of words to refer to something beyond. Take metaphysical, for instance. It is referring to a realm beyond the physical. The concept of meta, whether as a prefix or descriptor, requires reflection and awareness. Sometimes this awareness in a context where you wouldn't expect it gives us a sense of unease. With that said, I believe Mr. Wooka's puppet show is a cry for help. To put on a puppet show with in a puppet show as some sort of familiar escapism is one thing, but when even those puppets try to escape within their own puppet show, it depicts a sort of helplessness. There is no escape. The fact that this is within the episode about feelings is no coincidence. Feelings always bubble up in unexpected ways. I was half expecting Nana to ask Mr. Wooka if he's okay. Instead, Mr. Wooka dismisses the darkness of his subconscious. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> kind of a bit weird. We see the opposite of this in the next episode, Helpful Girl. Instead of going inward, there is now a fourth wall break in the puppet show. Gary the puppet dropped his food outside of the puppet show stage, and he asks Mona for help getting it. Now, if the puppets are a reflection of Mr. Wooka, who would he be asking for help if he were breaking the fourth wall? That's right, friends. Us. What would the orange Gary drop be representative of? Is there anything or any one orange that Mr. Wooka has shown a deep desire for? Is Mr. Wooka asking us to be his wingman? Pretty interesting that Nana's favorite fruit is also bananas. Wait, what? But hey, that's just a theory. Can you tell the MatPat news has been heavy on my mind? In the episode 123, Apple Tree, we even see that Mr. Wooka makes his own pinecone puppets. Did he create all the puppets he uses for his puppet shows? Even the alive ones? Hey, get out of here, Athena Patina! In the episode Goodbye, Nana casually drops the lyric, When your dad goes off to work, and your mom is going berserk, what? and she drops you off at Nana's. This is the first time they mention her dad being in the picture, and it being accompanied by the line, Mom is going berserk, is very odd to me. I know it's just a rhyme, but why couldn't the mom go off to work and the dad go berserk? I feel like that lines up more with what we've seen. But damn, is the mom just having a mental health low? Here's a TikTok they made addressing her dad with that viral Nemo song. Where's my dad? I'm all alone. But the comments are even more interesting. The official Nanaland TikTok says, no matter what, she's always got Nana. And somebody who seems a lot like me comes through with receipts. Isn't she at Nanaland because her dad is at work and her mom is going berserk? You're right. It's wrong of us to imply he's absent. He's a hardworking man out there supporting his family. Yes, whether he's a human, a carrot, or a pea, or an alien, or whatever, he's providing for his green wife and daughter. The conversation continues. The wiki implies that her mom is a single, hardworking mother. To that I say, Tooth, people flood wikis with their own headcanons all the time. But Nanaland Official, whoever's running this account is hilarious, by the way, responds with, Interesting, in one episode her mom mentions going out for date night with Mona's dad. Hope she wasn't running back to her ex. And I'm taking this comment and running with it. Nana, please sing a song so Mona's mom, aka your daughter knows her worth? Ugh, mom, I really don't need this right now. It's just a date. Well, sweetie, I have to say that reminds me of a little song that goes a little something like this. When somebody makes me mad and sad, I forgive them the first time. But if they do it repeatedly, I say bye. And if they leave your whole family behind, I say fuck him. Not literally, okay? So, not again. I already have my hands full with sweet little Mona here. <laughs> In the season three episode, Under My Wing, the mom sadly announces that she feels tired. And when everyone hugs her to cheer her up, she quickly says, I feel better. I feel better. Are you sure about that? Now, I don't mean to nitpick a single mom who works two jobs, who loves her kids and never stops. But I hope Nana emphasized the importance of therapy because it seems like she's really going through it. Because the only thing I know about this woman, other than that she's Mona's mom, is that she goes berserk and is tired. That is until the episode spring when Mona's mom got Nana flowers. Aww. I wish we had more moments between those two, between Mona's mom and Nana. Because other than Mona's mom thanking her at the end of every episode and hugging her goodbye, we don't see them talk that much. I'd love if the mom stayed and chatted for a little bit. We only saw that in the last episode, Winter Wonderland. In the episode, Purple Monster, we see Mona's mom in a new outfit and she exclaims that she had a great day. I think at this point in the series, Mona 
Mona's mom is starting to get over whatever slump she's in and I'm really happy for her. In the next episode, Bubbles, Mona's mother says, your dad has stew at home. So now the dad is very much in the picture. He wasn't mentioned at all in season two, but season three onward, as Mona's mom's mood improves, dad is being brought up left and right. I love that this series is more matriarchal, but having the mom mention the dad after so much time has passed and during an incredibly quick mood shift is not subtle. I think they were separated and got back together for better or worse, like that TikTok comment said. In the next episode, she mentions going gardening with Mona and she's talking with so much more energy and life in her voice. I really hope whatever's giving her this happiness lasts because she never talked like this in season two. I'm gonna try not to project my own experiences onto the show, but I'm not sure if I trust the dad yet. There, I said it! My first hot take on Russell was back during the shorts. My note as I watched read, I'm so sorry, I'm terribly sorry for what I'm about to say. In the short entitled Snow Person, the dog's voice acting is not something you should play out loud. This is the sound of the dog struggling when you don't have the visual. <coughs> 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 I don't want to know what everyone in my house thought I was watching, but his voice and his kangaroo legs are the least of his problems. First, I have to emphasize how smart this dog is. He helps fill up an inflatable pool by grabbing the hose and bringing it all the way over to them. He fully understands English. For example, Nana told him to scoot over, and he did. I'm not gonna lie, my dog can't do that. No? Can you scooch over? Scooch over. Yeah, but you scoot over. Scoot over. So now that you fully understand his comprehension level, his shenanigans seems less endearing. In the episode Goodbye, he steals Mona's balloon and Mona has to keep explaining to him, please, please stop that. Please don't let it go. It's going to float away. She repeats this over and over and she has to beg him. Please, Richard. Mm -hmm. And he finally takes her seriously. I would empathize with the dog more if he didn't know what was happening, but he clearly does and keeps causing trouble anyway. Something else I hate is how aggressive he is with the cat, Alice. Now I know what most of you are thinking, let it go. The cat versus dog plot line is, is a normal thing that occurs in many shows, but Alice is so sweet. It's not like there's a mutual hatred going on. She's very nice to him and he always scares her away, screaming in her face. Alice is also so cute. Her design and personality is better and I wish she had more screen time. In the episode Chipmunk in the House, Nana finally sets boundaries with this little menace. <laughs> Stop tugging on my dress. Thank you, finally. And after being a shithead to Nana, what does Russell do next? He steals Mona's toy. Listen, Mona laughs it off and treats it like a game, so I can't be too mad. But I think in order for her to be happier than her mom clearly is at this point, she has to learn to put her foot down like Nana. In the episode Love, Alice the Cat and Russell begin to bond. Alice is, as always, very nice, purring and brushing up against him. But it seems like acting halfway decent is absolutely killing Russell. He's holding in his rage. <laughs> <laughs> Repeatedly throughout the series, Russell scares away other animals that Mona is bonding with out of jealousy. I will give him this, by season three I thought Russell was acting a lot nicer. Way more thoughtful and caring to Mona, alerting Nana when there's trouble. But I spoke too soon. In the episode Sick as a Dog, he pretends to be sick to get in the same room as Mona, who actually has a fever. He barks in her face and jumps on the bed, which only makes her feel worse. I understand what they were going for with Russell's character. I feel like he's less of a dog and more of an annoying younger brother. But unfortunately for them, I can't stand it. Oh great, now he's destroying all the tissues. And I hate to say it, but this just means that Nana did not train him right. Also, why would you put that terror to society in the same room as your sick granddaughter? In the episode Bee Sting, Mr. Wooka puts on a whole puppet show about being careful around bees. With creepy imagery of this dude's tongue swelling up. But after watching that horror show, Russell decides he's gonna harass some bees. Fuck around and find out, if you will. I personally wouldn't. But Russell's whole personality is a stark contrast to every other character's. They are rational. He is not. Like I keep saying, if they leaned into him being a dog more, I would empathize with him. But every time he barks scaring away a creature, he maniacally laughs. He doesn't bark as a result of being overly excited. He barks to mess with other creatures. The one and only time I felt bad for Russell was in the episode Russell Did It. Nana got a valuable and rare piece of art that 
that she was very excited about. She tells Mona and Russell, do not touch this. Please do not touch this. And for once, Russell listened and Mona didn't. She's not perfect after all, and I love the show for showing that. Kids can be a handful. Get this, Russell even tried warning Mona, but she proceeded to not listen and accidentally broke the piece of art. And then blamed Russell. <laughs> Poor little dude was gobsmacked. Like, how is he gonna defend himself? He ended up being punished briefly and she was so overcome with guilt, she broke down. She started sobbing. She was like crying the hardest she ever has in this series. And she confessed. Oh, come here. What, tell me, tell me, tell me, Nana, what's wrong? And guys, I forgive her, okay? It seems that Russell grew throughout the show as well, so I have to give credit there. Even with my silly spin on the show, I can't deny the beauty of their friendship. And just the show overall. I really liked the show. When I say investigative journalism, what I actually mean is I watched their YouTube live stream and I paid $5 to ask where Mr. Wuka is. It's a great use of my money, actually. Here's what Mona said. Thank you, Athens, for the gift. Mr. Mr. Wooka's making puppet. I really hope they bring him out on social media because as far as I'm aware, they haven't shown him since 2004. I don't know if they have to make a new puppet for him. I'm so curious. A lot of my other theories were also confirmed. Mona kept exclaiming, there's all these people here in Nana Land. And we're all in Nana Land, but people are coming from all over the world. Remember what I said in my fourth wall break section? We're all her imaginary friends. Something kind of interesting is when someone asked if she'll ever age, Mona replied with, I'll, I'll never, never age. age. I'm, I'm Mona. Mona. I'm forever Mona. Mona. A very powerful line. <laughs> I also asked about her mom. This is hard hitting stuff, pay attention. She said, my mom's okay, she's working. That's why I'm at Nana's. I think I would have cried if she said, my mom's going berserk. That's why I'm at Nana's. Here's the last thing I want to point out. I sound different, I shouldn't. Cause maybe I had a code. That's why. Queen of improv right here. This show has a lot of heart and I loved hearing the creators talk about it in these interviews. Highly recommend watching them if you're interested in learning more. Apparently they haven't seen each other in 15 years and recently reunited. It's amazing to see how passionate they still are and how excited they are to return to this project after so long. I also watched this clip of Mona and Mr. Wuka as well as the puppeteers who voiced them singing to Agnes Peters, the real life inspiration for Nana's character. Character. I love this so, so much. I hope you enjoyed going on this journey with me as much as I did. Next week's video is about Insatiable, and the week after the last video of January is going to be another lore all about trolls. Stay tuned, and if you enjoyed, please consider subscribing, and as always, have a great day, butt lovers. Bye!